Hello. My name is Andrew Lindsay. I'm the Director of Applied Research and Development for Alpha Corporation, which is a civil structural engineering PM, sorry, uh, program project construction management firm as well as a controls firm. Um, so we hover roughly around uh, the 190 to 230 person marker, which makes us a very sort of interesting firm to interact with because not only do we interact with both the design side and the delivery side, but on top of that, we view ourselves as being small enough to be agile and large enough to be disruptive. And so what we started to look at was in what ways we could actually leverage our ability for agility and starting to explore many of these solutions. And um, over the course of the last two years, really started to embrace this idea of the possibility of blockchain being disruptive to a lot of the different things that we do in our industry. Um, in this specific use case, uh, what we were focusing on and continue to focus on is the ways that we could actually layer multiple applications of blockchain technology on top of each other to create efficiencies where we didn't really know where they, they would be found ultimately. Um, so some of the questions that we started to explore were actually questions that largely fall outside of the industry rather than inside the industry. And in what ways could we interact with the value chain and actually start talking in their language? And so when it came to the asset owners, when it came to the finance agencies, when it came to the insurance agencies and the insurance brokers, what kind of questions could we pose to them that were less re re reflective of our daily goings on but more reflective of the way we do our daily goings on and what kind of value does that deliver to the client. And so some of the questions that we started to explore were in what ways do various asset owners view capital expenditure versus operational expenditure? One being built into the value of the asset, the other being uh, a cost you'll pay out in that fiscal year. Uh, another being uh, operational performance versus building value. So currently, uh, neighbors even of mega asset owners will not disclose any information specifically for that purpose. Uh, the, the ability for them to not be efficient then devalues their building. And so not letting go of that information was extremely important to them. Being able to localize it was was where they live currently in the industry, according to what we found out. Um, I don't think I, I need to describe too much into the, the actual intelligence and data silos. Um, implementation costs versus life cycle incentives. In what ways could we actually start reshaping what those uh, incentives were um, and start actually factoring out implementation costs in a distributed fashion rather than just having sort of a centralized mega cost doing a lot of these sort of innovative things in the built environment. So to go through, um, I'm going to start off with the use case that we're looking at. Uh, then you know, why do we need it? I think it's going to be a lot of things that you've heard already, but at the same time, um, I think it also reflects sort of a growing aspect that I think reflects a turning point in the industry when it comes to risk. Um, incentive structures, so in what ways could we look at the value chain and actually start factoring out who receives what in turn for using this system, rather than sort of just mandating that they use it, what kind of incentives are in place for the value chain to actually start using this? Um, uh, for being, uh, what ways did we actually design our workflow flow, and, and what ways did we make it such that when it came to a mega asset owner or it came to an insurance agency that has a lot riding on this information, how could we break it down into something that was digestible? How could we make it such that they could get from you know, zero to one, be confident that they are secure at one, and then move to two? Um, and so going sort of differently with the, the sort of crash course model, I'm going much more on the iterative cycle. Um, and then finally the model itself. So the use case we started to look at was that facility management use case. Um, in looking at one of the challenges uh, for facility management, a lot of the onus actually falls on the facility manager to verify a lot of this information, to secure a lot of this information, to make sure that the information is available to various contractors and vendors when it is needed, and also to make sure that when something goes awry with a facility or any asset, 
uh, that, that they are on call and responsible for it. Um, and so what we found was that there was an opportunity to at least provide some ease to that facility manager by having the confidence that a lot of the things that they were setting up contracts to do, buying, were actually arriving, were actually being delivered. Um, and so in looking at that, we actually started to explore the full value chain, which was, okay, who actually signs off on that asset owner continuing to manage that building? Who actually allows for that asset owner to even entertain buying a building, let alone the ability for that as asset owner to get a preferred interest rate? And so then, in what ways can the, the asset owner then dictate to the facility manager what sort of ways they can improve their overall efficiencies while also incentivizing them to do so? And then finally, given the fact that you have so much information flowing between your own M manual, which the, one of the shocking things we found out in this process was, given the fact that so much of the built environment existed before this digital age, where the, the, the trend was building, say, a $200 million building and then dropping off 200 binders, which are then thrown into a boiler room, but I'll get to that later, um, and really never looked at until they're absolutely necessary or there is an emergency. Um, also, uh, how can you get the right information to the right contractors? Um, how can you make sure that they're aware of what has, been ha what has happened to this asset over the life cycle of that asset, be it a single pipe or an entirely complex robotic arm from, say, like a GM? So in what ways can we look at those various scales and actually start to explore this, this digital twin process at, at a digestible, low-risk, uh, verifiable uh, step. So I think what, uh, what I'm going to speak to is more on how we approach this and less sort of pitching on the idea because I think there are a lot of ways that groups could go about doing this. Um, so this is probably an image of one way or another that you've seen with this concept of a distributed ledger system interacting, but what we wanted to happen was we wanted to make sure that the value chain in many ways could interact with the facility itself, even if it changed hands. So say uh, an asset owner sells a building to another, at, uh, well, potential asset owner, um, and, and then you have all of that information that's stored away in 200 binders in your boiler room. You don't really know what's happened to each one of those assets in your building. That's risk. That is extreme risk, especially when we're talking quotes as high as two, three, four hundred million dollar buildings. And yet, for some odd reason, when we buy a car, we can dive right into the car facts. But if it's a two hundred million dollar building, where are the car facts? So looking at why we needed to implement this, I think I'm preaching to the choir and a converted here when it comes to all of these different aspects, be it fractured, di uh, fractured data silos, be it misaligned incentives. I was asking yesterday, you know, what happens when you come up with all of these different efficiencies and then in many cases you go to the contractor and they make money off of the lack of those efficiencies. So in what ways can we look at those misaligned incentives and start to look at distributed ledger technology and blockchain technology, and, and, and in what ways then could we, uh, as Arno was looking at as well, distribute those incentives appropriately? Um, processes and protocols, standards and codes, in what ways could we actually embed a lot of that information on distributed ledger systems such that you were aware of what those were when the building was built, how they've changed over the life cycle of the building, and then what specifically you're acting on based off of what you have available at your fingertips. And then finally, in what ways, well, high, high value asset exposure, so in what ways, again, does, say, an automotive manufacturing company value, say, a robotic arm versus a single pipe? Um, and then finally, in what ways does this all add up to risk? And who do we need to talk to about that? So when it came to the incentive structure, what we started to look at was, again, who do we need to speak to at this point? Um, and what we realized was it was the asset owner and the insur insurance agency, and we probably wanted them to be in the same room. Because the insurance agency was then able to relay why they have specific premiums in place, and the asset owner was able to essentially ask what ways they could reduce those premiums or make those premiums more dynamic. 
And what we found out was that if there was more access to data, that would also then enable firms, large insurance firms, to develop programs like pay-as-you-go premiums. And so as a result, instead of you know, resetting your premium every year, you could reset it bi-weekly, monthly. And that is actually something that is going to happen in the industry probably within the next two years. On top of that, in what ways could we link groups in like, say, a, a large bank? And if they have access to more information, then uh, what ways could they incentivize asset owners when it came to the financing of these projects? And then going uh, down the line, if you're receiving more money as that, or you have more flexibility with that money as that asset owner, in what ways then can you then redistribute that risk or instill in mitigated fashion by being able to access uh, capital earlier and then distribute capital earlier to your contractors and vendors? So the workflow. What we started to look at was uh, what would make sense for an asset owner to even remote, remotely be willing to explore? Um, and so we started off with, let's just sit down for a conversation and, and outline what it is that these asset owners want to do with a blockchain system when it came to their facility management process. The next was uh, organizing that information, which, going back to the point in hand, oftentimes would be a six to nine month process of document discovery where we were going through those boiler rooms and we were interacting with that information in binders. Um, the second being ledgering assets, and then limited on time, but I'll dive through this, ledgering assets so, such that even if it was paper documents, we could use things like robotic process automation, uh, to convert those paper documents into uh, digital ready documents. On top of that, we can now uh, convert PDF 2D documents all the way into a ledger system that has asset history. Um, phase three was creating the interoperabilities between the different systems that would enable you to see actually what is going on between those systems. Um, you know, you have all these different data silos, but what's exciting is that you have an opportunity to create efficiencies by using the robotic process automation as well as API keys to, to, to just plug them into a modular database. So you can actually see then that if you can take the information from your thermostats and you can take the th information from your humidity detection, what you're able to do is then cross-analyze that on the web and find out that you probably will have a mold problem in three years. And then finally, in what ways could we associate each and every asset to a smart contract such that the, the, the finite course of action for that asset was to re report to a specific person? Let's bring it back to bricks, sticks, and brick, uh, stones, where you have, you know, at one point or another, this has to come back to the built environment. And so, what, who is to call when it comes to that asset? Who do I need to report to? What needs to happen? What has happened to this asset? And then once it's done, what's the updated information? And this was the model we came up with, which was the first, I'll just speak loudly. The, the first screen really is, well, the first screen is really the alert. It's either an IoT system or it's just an identified problem at the asset. The second is then you have an inspector come on site as you would in a normal case, and you would have them make a recommendation that is logged on a distributed ledger system, such that that person's qualifications to make that recommendation, that person's firm, that person's history, and that also that recommendation specifically is also now ledgered in your history. So now you have a situation where if that facility manager, it goes back to the facility manager, if it's approved, it then goes off to the contractor and vendor for execution. You have the vendor who is flying apart, and you have the contractor that's coming on site at the same time because you're able to track that information. And once the, the, the job is executed, it then lets the facility manager know it's completed, who then lets the inspector know to come back on site and verify QA, QC, also on a ledger system, such that now you know who verified that the work was done appropriately and who actually did the work and where did the materials come from. And then finally, you have a situation where all of that gets filed in the claim automatically. And so, uh, 
Oh, and on top of that, sorry, what you end up having also is then the summary for the insurance company as well as the as uh, asset owner. So the asset owner maybe owns 10,000 buildings and doesn't really want to know about that one building. However, it would be nice to get an interoperable summary. And so that's really, uh, that's what we're doing. Um, that's what we're in the process of building out right now. Um, again, uh, I'm always looking to collaborate. And yeah, that is okay. our use case. <laughs>